This video was brought to you by the TLDR store, where we sell high quality enamel pin badges featuring our country to choose characters, including, rather appropriately for this video, the US, China, and the globe. Get 10% off by using code BIDEN10. The link is in the description. Hello, and welcome to another TLDR global video. In this one, we're going to be taking a look at possibly the biggest geopolitical question of our times, whether China will overtake the US. Today, we're going to be taking a look at three arguments that suggest China won't overtake America as the world's leading superpower. But before we get into the video, a few caveats. Firstly, before you jump down our throats on how blatantly pro-US and anti-China this video is for a nominally impartial channel, we're going to be doing a three reasons China will overtake the US video very soon. So chill out and subscribe to the channel to be notified when that video is released. Secondly, this isn't intended to be an exhaustive list. There's obviously more than three arguments to suggest that China won't overtake the US. These are just the three that we thought were most significant. Thirdly, by overtake, we mean overtake the US in terms of superpower status. What it means to be a superpower is difficult to define, and we're not going to try and give it a complete definition now. Fourthly and finally, we should say that we don't really want to be doing this sort of video. Ideally, the rise of China would be positive sum, meaning a better world economy and a higher standard of well-being for most Chinese people. Not a zero-sum, adversarial, us-or-them challenge to the US. Unfortunately though, that's just not how it's being framed. Both in US politics, where basically the only thing that Democrats and Republicans can agree on is the need to contain China, and in Chinese politics, where an increasingly nationalistic CCP spend most of their time testing the US. Anyway, disclaimers aside, let's get into the video. And the three reasons we're going to focus on are China's birth rate, China's lack of friends, and China's military. Let's start with China's birth rate. To maintain a stable population, a country needs a fertility rate, that is the number of births per female of 2.1. China's official fertility rate is about 1.6, but there is some dispute about this. A 2010 census implied that it was actually 1.2, and a 2016 survey by the Chinese State Statistics Bureau cited a figure as low as 1.05. China also has about 120 boys for every 100 girls. Both of these figures are consequences of China's one-child policy, which was only abandoned in 2016, and both pose a massive demographic problem for China. And that's because China's working age population has been shrinking since 2011. And the Financial Times reported, according to leaked census data, that China's population actually shrunk in 2020. Now, while China's official data disputes this, they released this data suspiciously late, and even the official data admits that population growth is slowing. A low fertility rate is a problem because it means an aging population, which means fewer working people and more pensioners. Now, China isn't alone in this respect. In fact, most countries in the developed world have fertility rates below 2.1. However, China is in particular trouble for two reasons. Firstly, China's birth rate is amongst the lowest. If the 1.2 figure is accurate, it will put it lower than everyone except Singapore, Malta, and South Korea. And secondly, China just doesn't do immigration. Other countries with fertility rates below 2.1 maintain their demographic balance by taking in younger migrants. For example, in 2016, the US, which has a fertility rate of 1.7, took in about 1.2 million migrants. Compare that to China, who issued just 1,576 permanent residency cards over the same time period. Now, this doesn't mean that China's doomed. In October 2015, they scrapped their 36-year-old one-child policy in favour of a two-child policy. And then in May 2020, they introduced a three-child policy. Unfortunately for the CCP, though, reversing the decline in fertility rates is nearly impossible. Sweden, for example, has some of the best child support in the world, but even after introducing all of that, still only has a fertility rate of 1.66. There are more extreme measures the CCP could take. 
the USSR enforced a very successful childlessness tax from 1941 to 1992, which took 6% of income from any childless man between 25 and 50 and any childless woman between 20 and 45. But that's a pretty extreme solution, and there's no guarantee even that would reverse the trend. The second reason that China won't overtake the US is its terrible diplomacy. Chinese wolf warrior diplomacy is notoriously aggressive. Some of the highlights include the Chinese embassy in Brazil accusing Bolsonaro of having a mental virus, a Chinese minister referring to Justin Trudeau as boy, and promoting a baseless conspiracy theory that the coronavirus originated in the US. It's not just on Twitter either. China has become increasingly aggressive in asserting its territorial claims, whether that's Taiwan, the South China Sea, or the China-India border. This sort of wolf warrior diplomacy might be well received by a domestic audience, but it's made China one of the least liked countries in the world. According to Pew Research data, in 2002, everyone apart from Italy had a net favourable opinion on China, with an average approval rating of positive 17. By 2020, none of the survey countries had a net favourable opinion, and the average had fallen to negative 51. Now, it is worth noting that countries in the developing world have a better attitude towards China. Africa, South America, and the Middle East all have broadly positive attitudes of China. But even countries that like China aren't actually allies. China has basically no allies, save for a testy relationship with Russia based on mutual disdain for the US. In fact, China's only formal ally is North Korea. Conversely, there are many countries whose populations don't actually like the US, but are still US allies. For example, both Canada and Australia have net negative perceptions of the US, but they're still exceptionally close allies. The point is that deep and lasting alliances are a key part of being a superpower, and China just doesn't seem to understand this. The third and final reason that China won't overtake the US that we're going to look at today is their military. There are two aspects to this argument. Firstly, while China's military is actually ahead of the US in certain respects, for example, China now has the most advanced cruise and ballistic missile technology in the world, in general, it is still a fair bit behind. While Chinese defence spending has been increasing by an incredible 12% a year for the last generation, it's still way behind US military spending. And obviously, the US's higher history of spending gives them an advantage. Over the last 20 years, the US has spent some $14 trillion on its military. China has spent just $2 trillion or so. Now, in general, those numbers aren't very informative. For example, net spending doesn't tell you much about who'd win in a fight over Taiwan. But it does tell you that China's military isn't yet ready to be a superpower military. For example, the US is currently committed to defend its 29 allies in NATO, and has offered military protection to roughly 30 other countries, including Japan, Australia, South Korea, and much of Latin America. China just isn't ready to play this role. China hasn't fought in a war since it last clashed with Vietnam in 1979, and has just one military base overseas, in Djibouti. Sometimes, analysts argue that China doesn't need military power because of its immense economic power. But economic power is always politically divisive. China is the largest trading partner of Japan, South Korea and Australia. But all of these countries have defied Beijing in recent years. South Korea let the US deploy a missile defence system in their territory. Japan has refused to yield on its territorial disputes, and Australia infuriated Beijing by calling for an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19, before signing up to the implicitly anti-China AUKUS Defence Pact, despite unofficial Chinese sanctions on Australian coal, which seems to have just mainly hurt China in recent weeks. Anyway, you get the point. Being a superpower has historically meant projecting military might, and China, well, they're just not ready for it yet. 
So those are our three most significant reasons why China won't overtake the US. And if you enjoyed this video, and if you want to see the other side of this in our upcoming video on why China will overtake the US, alongside other content on everything from Ethiopia's civil war to our epidemic of shrinking penises, then consider subscribing to the channel. Also, like I said at the start, you can pick up our Countries with Shoes pins over on the TLDR store not only including the US, China and the world, but also more than 50 other countries. And if you use code BIDEN, you'll get 10% off, as well as the satisfaction of knowing you're helping us make more content like this. Thanks so much for your support. Also, a special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.